motivation for tourism. If you were to find a reason as to why your neighbor or friend is taking a holiday, that neighbor or friend could probably give you a long list of good reasons. These reasons, however, would be influenced by his or her personality type, education, values, he or she attaches to a holiday and so on. Among the several reasons he may include rest and relaxation, seeing different places than his own, meeting his family members or enjoying sun, surf and sea. Therefore, it becomes important to differentiate between various stated reasons and motivations for travel. The various reasons stated by tourists to travel may not all be motivations. Many of these may be the destination facilities and amenities which are available at the destination. Although important, these reasons are not motivations. Motivation can be defined as a force within an individual which compels him or her to do something to fulfill a psychological or a biological desire. In this module, we are going to discuss about tourism as behavior, early influences for the growth of tourism, basic travel motivators, motivational reasons, destination and non-destination travel motivators. Tourism as Behavior In attempting to account for both consistency of behavior and its change, psychologists have found it useful to use certain concepts that determine the motives, the drives or concerns which are being satisfied by the action and the attitudes and information that the person uses to decide what response he should make in a given situation. A motive can be defined as a person's basic predisposition to reach for or to strive towards a general class of goals. Motivated striving may be based upon biological needs and desires acquired through an extended period of past experience. Attitude, on the other hand, is a more circumscribed concept. It can generally be conceived of as an inner factor predisposing one to react positively or negatively towards particular objects, acts or institutions. A person's disposition or attitude towards an object is likely to depend upon a. the basic motive with which the object is associated and b. the degree to which the object is perceived as instrumental for satisfying or blocking these motives. In an account of the behaviours of people, we start our description with a reference to some kind of active driving force that the individual seeks, the individual wants, the individual fears and so on. In addition, we specify an object or condition towards which that force is directed. For example, he seeks wealth, he wants peace, he fears something. The study of the relationships between these two variables, the driving force and the object or condition towards which that driving force is directed, is the study of the dynamics of behaviour or motivation. The basic principles or dynamics accounting for the behaviour of going to a temple, joining a particular association, choosing a mate etc. are the same no matter how simple or how complex the activity. Such principles, if they are to be helpful in making accurate predictions of individual behaviour and increasing our understanding of the social phenomenon, must answer questions such as What induces these driving forces of wanting, seeking and fearing in individuals? What determines, for different individuals, the specific nature of the objects or conditions towards which 
these driving forces are directed. How does it happen that in achieving his goal, the individual sometimes carries out this integrated series of acts? What happens when the individual, no matter how strong the driving force, fails to achieve his goal? Knowing the answers to these questions, certain other important issues arise. Does everyone have the same wants, needs and fears? Can an individual's wants, needs and fears be changed? Can one goal be substituted for another goal to satisfy the same wants? How can conflicting demands be resolved? The answers to these involve basic principles of perception, thinking and learning, as well as of motivation. The question of motivation is the question of why. Why do some people travel and others not? Why, in a particular country, do more people engage in tourism than in another? Or, for that matter, why does one member of a family undertake travel and others do not? Various studies of tourism psychology and motivation show that individuals normally travel for more than one reason and for many, perhaps the majority, tourism is the outcome of a combination of motivations. Early Influences Prior to the emergence of mass tourism, Particularly since the First World War, the growth of tourism was the result of certain sets of influences which were observed more particularly in the Western world. As a result of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, there emerged a large and prosperous group in the Western society. The group subsequently became richer since there was a general increase in the material wealth as industrialization grew and trade and commerce developed. This increase in the industrial activity, in turn, gave rise to new settlements and towns and cities were built to accommodate the increasing number of workforce which was engaged in the industries, trade and commerce. Population came to be increasingly concentrated in towns and cities. The introduction of the railway system first in England and then elsewhere in other parts of Europe and America, resulted in provision of cheap and quick means of inland travel. The steamship met the need for international travel. A number of steamship companies, both in Europe and America, came up, resulting in increase in international travel. To cater to the needs of tourists, many big hotels and other accommodation facilities were built. Travel came to be organized with the emergence of travel organizers, tourist literature and certain other travel services. The three major developments, increase in the wealth of the industrial society, development of the means of transport and the organization of travel, were first witnessed in England and America. However, their influence soon spread across other countries in Europe and elsewhere. The basic motives to engage in tourism, which had been apparent even much before the middle of the 19th century, can be said to be curiosity, seeking material gains by engaging in trade and commerce, and education and health. To this, another motive, recreation can be added, which certainly is a result of industrialization. As no scientific studies were made in that period to determine the motive for travel, it can be safely said that there could have been many more motives besides the basic motives of curiosity, trade, commerce, education, health and recreation. Motivation also includes secondary needs such as success, prestige, achievement, recognition and socialization. The recent geopolitical changes made in different regions of the world have also had a great influence on the scale and structure of tourism. The downfall of communism and democratization of societies in former socialist countries are events 
which have an impact on modern tourism and other parts of the world, have witnessed similar processes within their societies. Basic Travel Motivators Travel motivators are those factors that kindle a person's desire to travel. They are the internal psychological influences affecting individual choices. Motivations for travel incorporate a broad range of human experiences and behaviours. A brief list of travel motivations might include rest and relaxation, recreation, excitement, social interactions with friends and relations, adventure, physical challenges, status and escape from routine work and stress. McIntosh has stated that basic travel motivators may be grouped into the following four categories. Physical motivators, cultural motivators, interpersonal motivators, status and prestige motivators. Physical motivators. Physical motivators are related to physical relaxation and rest, sporting activities and specific medical treatment. All are connected with the individual's bodily health and well-being. Cultural motivators. Cultural motivators which are connected with the individual's desire to travel in order to learn about other countries and their cultural heritage expressed in art, music, literature, folklore, etc. Interpersonal motivators. Interpersonal motivators which are related to a desire to visit relatives, friends or to escape from one's family, work myths or neighbours or to meet new people and forge new relationships, new friendships or simply to escape from the routine of everyday life. Status and prestige motivators are identified with the needs of personal esteem and personal development. These are related to travel for business or professional interests, for the purpose of education and the pursuit of hobbies. Motivational Reasons Why do increasing number of people engage in tourism? Motivators could be broken down and elaborated to give us more reasons as to why an increasing number of people engage in tourism. These include Pleasure Getting away from all that routine of everyday life is perhaps the most important motive of all in recent times. The individual's desire and the need for pure pleasure is very strong indeed. The significance of the pleasure factor is widely utilised by travel agents and tour operators who are astute psychologists when it comes to selling tour packages. Rest, relaxation and recreation. Industrialization and urbanization have created great pressures on modern living. The stress and strain of modern city life has made it yet more necessary for people to get away from all this and relax in an atmosphere which is more peaceful and healthy. There may be various forms of relaxation and rest. To some, it is secured by change in the environment. Some others seek sunshine and excitement at seaside or other resorts and some in seeing new places, meeting strangers. Health, the development of spas during the Roman Empire was the result of people's desire to seek good health. The subsequent establishment of many sanatoria in Switzerland was the result of the awareness on the part of the people of the various benefits of good health. Many travelled to spas and clinics for curative baths and medical treatment. In some countries like Italy, Austria and Germany, great importance is given to spa treatment. In Russia, along the Black Sea coast and in the foothills of the Caucasus mountains, there are many world-famous sanatoria where millions of Russians and international tourists throng every year. Participation in sports There has been an increasing number of participation in a wide variety of sporting activities such as mountaineering, walking, skiing, sailing, fishing, sunbathing, trekking, 
boating, surf riding etc. More and more people these days are taking holidays involving physical activities. The visitors go to places primarily to indulge in a sporting activity to which all their energies are directed. Curiosity and Culture Curiosity has been one of the major reasons for tourism. An increasing number of people are visiting historical places with an ancient past or places holding special art festivals, music festivals, theatre and other cultural activities or events of importance. The increasing interest shown by many in other people's culture is but another aspect of man's curiosity to seek more knowledge. International events like the Olympic Games, Asian Games, national celebrations, exhibitions, special festivals etc. attract thousands of tourists. Ethnic and family. This includes visiting one's relatives and friends, meeting new people and seeking new friendships. A large number of people travel for interpersonal reasons. A large number of Americans visit European countries in order to see their homeland. Every year, thousands of people visit India for ethnic reasons. Spiritual and religious Visiting religious places has been one of the earliest motivators of travel. A large number of people have been making pilgrimages to sacred, religious or holy places. This practice is widespread in many parts of the world. For instance, in the Christian world, a visit to Jerusalem or the Vatican is considered auspicious. In the Arab Muslim world, a pilgrimage to Mecca is considered a great act of faith. In India, there are many pilgrimage centers and holy places belonging to all the major religions of the world. Status and Prestige This concerns the ego needs and personal development. Many people undertake travel with a view to talking about it to their relatives and friends. They like to impress them by relating their experiences in the various places visited. They also travel because they think it's fashionable to do so and perhaps show that they can afford to do it. Foreign tour is a magic word and people like to mention it to their friends and their acquaintances. Professional or business Attending conventions and conferences related to the profession, industry or commerce or to some organization to which the individual belongs has become very popular. Convention travel has made great strides in recent times. Hotels also provide facilities for conventions as a large number of people travel for business and professional reasons. Conventions and conferences associated with education, commerce, industry, politics and various professions are increasingly being held in various parts of the world. Although some people travel strictly for business purpose, the majority link business travel with pleasure. Destination and non-destination travel motivators. Motivation can be classified as destination related and non-destination related. Destination related travel motivators are those that allow a tourist to select any area, attraction where he or she would like to go. Tourists are not restricted to a specific destination or an area within a destination. A cost comparison can always be made before making a decision. On the other hand, non-destination related factors are not related directly to a destination. The determining factor in this travel is the cause rather than the destination itself. This would include travel for business, education, visiting friends and relations, VFR travel, health and pilgrimage. Professor Kraft cites a series of motivations which he considers as the determining impulses of tourism in the past and present. As the first motivating factor, Kraft mentions the exploration of the close and distant neighbourhood. 
If we proceed from the fact that foreign lands and people were originally looked upon as dangerous and even hostile, it is obvious that considerable personal courage was required to visit or confront them. Only a strong man with initiative could dare to forsake the security of the family or the clan and travel to nearby or distant places. The second motivation advanced by Kraft is divine service. Originally, this also implied an exceptional and social position, for it was a prerogative reserved for the priests to visit places considered as abodes of the deities, and it was only gradually that the worldly high-ranking persons were able to approach them. The same held true for the third motivation, which is participation in events of religious or secular authority. Such participation was again reserved for the selected few, that is, those of higher social positions. The utilization of natural medical cures or journeys to watering places as the fourth motivating factor is again characterized by being restricted to particular social classes. At first, the nobility, and later, the well-to-do bourgeois. Here, the restrictions follow from the fact of long distances and the related high cost of travel and sojourn. The final motive force mentioned by Kraft is the enjoyment of nature. It was the intellectual call for a return to nature which first exercised the spell and made trips into what was now considered as magnificent nature a favourite social practice. But here again, the high cost resulted in this practice being restricted to the well-off, that is, the higher social classes. The second group consists of tourists, in the pure sense, who have a freedom of choice. This group decides for themselves whether they should apply a part of their leisure time to participate in tourism. They also decide for themselves where and when to go. The demand of travel for this group, as compared to the demand for the former group, is highly price elastic, that is, susceptible to price inducements. The reason for travel in the case of businessmen and others in the first group is self-evident. Each may indeed be marginally influenced by those considerations which affect the second group, the pleasure travellers. This may be reflected in the frequency of visits or the consideration of alternatives as, for example, in the choice of venues for conventions and conferences. However, no particular problem is faced in identifying the motivations. In pleasure or holiday travel, on the other hand, the reasons are varied and not always clearly evident or easily identifiable. The prime motivation to engage in tourism is to be elsewhere and to escape, however temporarily, from the routine of everyday life. From this basic motivation, two principal and distinct motivations may be stipulated as dominant. These have been described by Professor Gray as wanderlust and sunlust. Wanderlust describes the desire to exchange the known for the unknown or familiar with the unfamiliar, to leave things familiar and to go and see different places, people and cultures or architecture of the past in places famous for their historical monuments and also past associations. This also involves seeing current fashions. Sunlust, on the other hand, generates a type of travel which depends on the existence elsewhere of better amenities and facilities other than those available in the home country of the traveller. It is commonly associated with such activities as sports and search for sunshine. Wanderlust calls for facilities geared to short-stay visitors. Sunlust, on the other hand, requires facilities for a longer stay and for recreation. Well, that brings us to the end of the discussion on motivations for tourism. I am sure the discussion would have thrown more detail into the various factors that form the basis for driving someone into 
choosing a destination based on his or her requirement. Keeping these factors in mind, we can work towards developing tourism in a particular region. Firstly, we need to see if a particular region has one or more of these motivators. If yes, then that place could be a natural choice and if not, we need to plan to build adequate infrastructure to make it a favorite destination. Thank you.